good afternoon everybody i welcome you on behalf of the vice chancellor registrar registrar evaluation and finance officer of uh, rajiv gandhi university of health sciences i welcome you to this webinar on covid 19 management the speaker today is dr satur uh, rghs has been constantly trying to update uh, the current levels of knowledge amongst the various stakeholders and this is the initiative of our honorable vice chancellor i take this opportunity to request him to kindly deliver the opening remarks and introduce the speaker thank you sir thank you dr mahendra it's a great pleasure that uh, uh, we are conducting this sort of a cme program uh, week after week in fact twice a week and uh, today we have none other than dr satur gb satur uh, who is a very senior physician and the senior medical uh, uh, officer care uh, in hubli satur medical care is the center where he is uh, practicing he is, uh, has a vast uh, experience in the field of uh, medicine he has been a regular speaker regular orator in uh, most of the tv programs in uh, doordarshan akashvani and others otherwise dr satur has got rich experience in uh, management of covid cases as well and he is also the member of our subject expert committee uh, and we always welcome his uh, valuable suggestions dr satur uh, yes. uh, welcome to you on behalf of dr uh, uh, i mean rajiv gandhi university of health sciences and all the yes, team that we have here it's such a pleasure to have you sir and uh, we look forward to a fruitful uh, uh, deliberation on this subject which is uh, a critical appraisal on the use of usage of anticoagulants in uh, covid therapy management of covid uh, cases we know that uh, the two drugs which are very important in the management of covid is steroids and anticoagulants and the timing of these drugs is very important when it has to be used how long it has to be used what is the dosage that has to be given in uh, different patients is all that matters i'm sure dr satur would highlight all those issues and uh, give, give a clarity to all the uh, delegates that we have today thank you so much sir i won't take much time i leave the field open to you thank you very much sir thank you um, thank you sir uh, honorable uh, vice chancellor uh, pleasure indeed um, the, to be part of this uh, this meeting and thanks for a nice uh, introduction can i share the screen please yeah okay is my screen uh, clearly visible yes, yes. Okay. okay yeah um right um this is i'm just going to speak uh, uh, something on uh, the anticoagulation in in covid management uh, we know that although covid has been there with us only hardly for about 18 months A tremendous amount of uh, research has gone into it probably this is the only other other area uh, after uh, statins uh, where the number of research papers uh, have exceeded any other field of of medicine uh, apart from the devastation that uh, the covid 19 has caused you must be thankful that it has taught us some nice new words Uh, this was not in our dictionary in the webster dictionary social distancing lockdown stay safe corona warriors quarantine work from home especially it people so we have so this has taught us some new words and <clears throat> this all began at uh, wuhan uh, in in china uh, call it uh, a lab uh, worm or call it whatever you like Uh, an accidental uh, virus coming out but anyway uh, undoubtedly it has led to a tremendous disruption of the global economy uh, after the second world war uh, and what, something that is very important is the treatment is fairly symptomatic uh, because uh, we really don't know how exactly to tackle this virus and typical british saying says Uh, where there is no specific treatment there are many treatments uh, and covid 19 actually suits uh, this definition and covid 19 not only affects the respiratory system uh, which has got a plenty of uh, uh, ace receptors 
you know they are ACE receptors are also there in the heart, in the kidney and pancreas to uh, name some uh, organs. This of course uh, is a typical subpleural picture that all of us are used to, uh, which has got a different scoring system. And a typical uh, um, ABG levels uh, were unpredictable uh, hypoxia, uh, beginning with the happy hypoxia um, and can suddenly dip and uh, push the patient uh, into a respiratory failure. So let us see what exactly is the coagulopathy that is associated with the COVID-19. Uh, it's pretty well understood, but nevertheless, what is important is that there is a definite there is a definite amount of uh, vascular endothelial uh, damage leading to endothelitis. And some of the autopsies done have shown that the alveolar capillary has got a thrombus in it. And even the small arterioles showed uh, a thrombus, microthrombi, meaning this is more sort of a vascular rather than a pulmonary alveolar tissue although that does happen. This, of course, is a is diaphragmatic, uh, diagrammatic representation. You can have either a very large pulmonary embolism or it can be into distal microvascular occlusion uh, leading to uh, different pathophysiological situations. Now, how exactly does the coronavirus tackle is not known, but some of the postulations are that the spike protein has a tremendous affi affinity to the ACE receptors on the endothelial cell, and it can directly damage the endothelium, causing the endothelial dysfunction. And also, it excites certain pro-inflammatory agents like interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, and also there is an increased viscosity caused by this. All in all, there is inflammation, hyperproteinemia, hyperviscosity leading to a hypercoagulable state. And of course, one has to think of a combination of this with the Virchow's triad. As we know, the triad has endothelial injury, stasis, and hypercoagulable state. We saw all of this now. We saw that there is an endothelial injury uh, where which releases the inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6, acute phase reactants. Stasis occurs because patient has been immobilized uh, for quite a length of time. And ultimately you have a hypercoagulable state uh, which has resulted in elevated uh, Willebrand factor, increased D-dimer, elevated fibrinogen, neutrophil extracellular traps, and all these changes ultimately lead to a severe uh, uh, coagulopathy uh, in these patients. Along with coagulopathy, we have got, of course, overlapping coagulation disorders. There will be some amount of sepsis that occurs as a secondary infection, which itself has got a DIC unrelated to the COVID-19 coagulopathy that you get. Of course, you get a hemophagocytic syndrome, antiphospholipid syndrome, thrombotic microangiopathy. All in all, it is not just uh, one factor. It is tremendously multifactorial, ill-understood. Uh, the vasculopathy that we see in presence of COVID-19, the infection. Now the thromboembolism, the coagulopathy is common in these people. It could be both venous and the arterial uh, resulting in stroke, in the deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and acute coronary syndromes. Now it can be a very asymptomatic, and now we know that in the second wave, large number of patients are asymptomatic. And one of the theories say that for each one asymptomatic or asymptomatic patient, there are six to 16 patients who are asymptomatic. Now, it can of course lead to a sudden organ dysfunction leading to death. Of course, apart from coagulopathy, uh, you have got ARDS, acute respiratory failure, kidney injury, and liver failure. What is important is the disseminated intravascular coagulation is a strong predictor of mortality where almost 71% of those who don't survive, they meet this criteria for the DIC. These are some of the very well-planned studies. You could see that the uh, venous uh, thromboembolic episodes were almost around 25% in China, 
And even in Italy, you could see that they were in a sizable number, and so they were in the Netherlands. In the last six months, uh, Netherlands has really done tremendous work in formulating some of the guidelines, which we'll go through. Now, what is the difference between the normal DIC that we see following sepsis in our routine practice, and what is this coagulopathy that the COVID-19 causes? This difference is extremely important to understand for the simple reason the treatment depends on it. So the major clinical finding with COVID is thrombosis, while with the routine DIC that we see is a bleeding. Prothrombin time is normal or increased, but it is always increased in the septic uh, DIC. And the APTT is normal, whereas it is increased here. Platelet count, I think something that is important here, although it says normal increased or decreased, we often see thrombocytopenia in most of the patients, although it can be normal uh, even in severely ill COVID-19 patients, whereas in the septic induced DIC, platelet counts are invariably decreased and fibrinogen is increased in COVID-19, decreased in the septic DIC. D-dimer, of course, is increased in both and antithrombin is increased here and decreased here. Of, of all these, I think clinically uh, important is to note that it is a thrombotic coagulopathy while the septic DIC is a bleeding coagulopathy. So having said this, uh, we definitely come across the uh, hematological parameters, which are definitely a bit different in the COVID-19 coagulopathy. Uh, we have got the prolonged prothrombin time, prolonged APTT, D-dimer is increased, there is a neutrophilia, there is thrombocytopenia, decreased lymphocytes, decreased eosinophils, elevated neutrophil lymphocyte ratio to more than nine, and you can have the fibrinogen degradation products, anticardiolipin IgA antibodies can be present, antiphospholipids, lupus anticoagulant has been increasingly found especially in the American subsect. And of course, you have the elevated WF antigen and elevated factor eight. <clears throat> now regarding D-dimer, there has been tremendous confusion, uh, confusion even amongst the treating physicians across, not only here, but all over. So let us clear that once for all. It's a degradation product of a cross-linked fibrin indicating augmented thrombin generation and a fibrin dissolution plasmid. High D-dimer levels are common in any acutely ill individual, either it be infectious or inflammatory. However, some of the markers like D-dimer appear to correlate with the illness severity. I think this is important to know. It is unknown if the intensification of anticoagulant therapy based on biomarker thresholds alone improves patient outcome, meaning Suppose it trebles, the D-dimer trebles over a, over a length of time, and you happen to increase the dosage of anticoagulant from prophylactic to the treatment schedule. Does it improve the outcome is something that has not been answered. Now, D-dimer, increased in D-dimer is not specific uh, for ETE, we know that. So therefore, one of these uh, thrombosis, uh, uh, the uh, Journal of Thrombosis and Thrombolysis uh, did suggest that against the daily monitoring of D-dimer for the purpose of guiding anticoagulant therapy, uh, many uh, hospitals keep doing it, which is really not necessary. Acutely worsening clinical status in conjunction with the laboratory values, uh, changes such as rising D-dimer may necessitate further thromboembolic workup. Work More than 1,500 nanogram per mil has a sensitivity of 85% and a specificity of 88% for detecting VTE. Nevertheless, so it cannot be undermined, neither can you base uh, up the dose of the anticoagulant depending on the D-dimer. So depending on this, uh, we have uh, many uh, guidelines here from NIH, from Anticoagulation Forum, from the American College of Cardiology, and from the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemorrhage. Each one have their own, let us see here. In this it says, insufficient data 
uh, to recommend the hematologic and co coagulation parameters to guide management decisions. Here also it says according to the uh, ACC, associated thrombosis D-dimer more than two times could suggest that there is a higher risk for ETE. And in that case, they say that you could have an extended profile access, which is almost up to 45 days, especially in patients who have a low risk of bleeding. And the anticoagulation forum has a guideline where marker thresholds such as D-dimer for guiding anticoagulation management should not be done outside the setting of a clinical trial. And the International Society of Thrombosis and Amherst says D-dimer levels should not be used solely to guide anticoagulation regimes. So I think this is very important to manage that. So just in the management of the thrombosis in COVID-19 patients, who should receive the anticoagulants? Routine anticoagulant profile access is not recommended for patients who are not hospitalized. All COVID-19 patients who require hospitalization should receive anticoagulation prophylaxis unless contraindicated. And, and of course, uh, you can see this uh, very easily seen pyramid uh, where as you go high up the pyramid, uh, the color goes on becoming red and dangerous. So from moderate to severe, uh, until to a very severe cases, uh, one need to think of the VTE prophylaxis, especially if the patients have got many comorbid uh, states like age, old age, bedridden, inflammatory response is more uh, with an endothelial injury, especially patients who are immunocompromised, like patients with AIDS or diabetes, or those who already have got malignancy. Now, in these patients, uh, one has to really think of uh, taking up anticoagulation more seriously. Now, what about, uh, how do we risk score as to who needs the anticoagulation? We all know this, that uh, there are different types of scoring systems, the Pandua score, the Hasbleed score, and also you have got the Dick score here, the final one. But let us just take an example on the Pandua scoring. Suppose you have a, a patient with COVID-19 and think that this guy has been bed bound. So that is a reduced mobility takes it to 0.3 points there. Think he is more than 70 years of age at 1.4 points. And he probably also had an MI, might have had a stenting done to five points. This guy definitely fits into a very high risk score for, 80, for, for the venous thromboembolic episodes. This could mean a bleed, this could mean just a thrombotic episode uh, like a DIC. So that all depends on the other conditions associated. This risk scoring system, whether you use the Easter-Dick score or the Hasbled score or the Padua score, there are just some rough guidelines, nevertheless give you an idea of how to go about with this. Now, what about the types of anticoagulation that you see? We all know this. Most of us are used to uh, the standard thrombo uh, profile axis here. Dosing of anticoagulation do not require monitoring here. Whereas the therapeutic dosing is used for treatment of acute venous thromboembolism. We all know this. And intermediate dosing is something that has not been uh, properly standardized. <clears throat> Although, <clears throat> uh, if you are not very happy to go ahead straight away with the therapeutic dosing, but at the same time, patient is is in a more risky state than a standard thromboprofile axis, one would think of uh, an intermediate dosing. Uh, in the standard uh, thromboprofile axis, of course, uh, platelet counting, monitoring uh, after five to seven days if unfractionated heparin is used. And what is important is the BMI. If the patient has got a very morbidly uh, obese person then even if it is a, a standard thromboprofile axis, you may have to use an increased dosage. A nice article has recently appeared where, ironically, the author says uh, the pharmacokinetics of the anticoagulants change differently, change rather too much in, in an obese patient. So giving him the standard dosage, for example, enoxaparin, BD, 40, whatever you want to give, 
is something like going to buy a pant to a shop without knowing your size. So uh, that's what he very nicely says that you really need to up the dosage of even standard thromboprophylaxis in morbidly obese patients. Now, there have been tremendous uh, uh, guidelines as to uh, working group, as to how to recommend the antithrombotic treatment. Uh, this is one of the Spanish society, which has been extensively used in Europe. And of course, the European Society of Cardiology uh, probably has come out with a, a very easy uh, way of going around flow chart. All admitted patients with COVID, uh, you tend to see whether they have a very high risk of thromboembolism or they have a low risk of thromboembolism. In the high risk, we of course know that patient's respiratory rate is high, has got a labored breathing, O2 saturation is low, he has got raised um, CRP, raised D-dimer, and raised fibrinogen levels. You probably think of admitting him to ICU, uh, then think of either using the heparin drip and you know, in which case you need to uh, monitor the uh, APTT, the active prothromboplastin time. And if you are not very keen, you can in fact also think of uh, inoxaparin, one milligram per kg twice a day, or you can in, in, in think of using uh, the uh, routine heparin, unfractionated heparin. If the patient has got a low risk of thromboembolism, a significant number of patients belong to this. Then you look at D-dimer. This is where D-dimer importance comes. More than three, less than 0.5, and between 0.5 to three. If it is more than three, straightway go ahead with inoxaparin because this is a bomb ready to explode uh, with one milligram per kg uh, BID, and then somewhere a very low level of uh, D-dimer Inoxaparin can be once a day, and when it is in between levels, you can think of starting it twice a day. However, when you see a patient with a higher D-dimer level, which may have a propensity to go on increasing, then you think of doing the perform point, point, what is called as focus, point of care ultrasound. Why, who should not be done ultrasound? We'll go uh, through those slides a bit later on. When it is positive, continue therapeutic anticoagulation, and if negative, de-escalate to enoxaparin 40 milligram BD, meaning whether the patient is in low risk, but of an upper range of a low risk or in the high risk, all these patients basically need anticoagulation. Of course, this is uh, another way of, uh, of looking at it. This is another approach. I don't need to go through this again, all of us are very much used to all this. Only thing to know, and this is whenever you admit a patient of COVID-19, without a prior anticoagulant therapy, question remains, is there a very high suspicion of uh, the VTE? And if you have got a very high suspicion of venous thromboembolic episode, straightway you go on to the uh, anticoagulant dosage of the low molecular heparin, no questions asked. Whereas if you think that patient doesn't really meet the, uh, the, the severe, uh, severity criteria, then one can think of, as in the previous slide, the prophylactic dosing, keeping an eye on the normal kidney function where you need to, for example, you know, saparin has been a very favorite drug in India. It's very important to get used to uh, one drug uh, because you tend to uh, know its half-life, its pharmacokinetics, its pharmacodynamics, rather than changing the drugs because a new company uh, has come out with more lucrative uh, goodies for us. So I think in managing COVID-19, uh, we need to be very careful. And finally, of course, at the time of discharge, in oxaparin 40 milligram per 24 hours, uh, um, this is foremost for about seven to 10 days, except for patients requiring anticoagulant doses. Promote early mobilization and walking at home. Meaning, once you discharge the patient, what kind of a patient goes home with the oral anticoagulation? We need to see them in the next few slides. 
This is an example of another very easier anticoagulation therapy uh, for COVID care centers or in, or in the periphery, for example, straightway classified them into mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, in mild, again, it tries to see whether is there is a bleeding risk. If it is high, no anticoagulation. And if the bleeding risk is low, uh, then you think of uh, giving either a prophylactic dose Whereas, as against moderate or severe, uh, one has to think of either an intermediate dose or a prophylactic dose. So very important to know this, especially when you come to the severe critical pneumonia where patients, SpO2 is less than 90 and heart rate is pretty high, breathing rate is pretty high. If there is a high bleeding risk, don't escalate from prophylactic dose. I think this is very important because Many, many uh, doctors are hesitant to up the dose of anticoagulation uh, with the threat that there could be a bleeding episode. So these criteria have to be very regularly followed and probably go through these uh, um, criteria that have been laid and go through the risk category and then see whether you need to give a prophylactic dose or an intermediate dose or a therapeutic dose. So my idea of stressing the point here is just because you have put a patient on uh, in ICU who has been requiring very higher and higher doses of oxygen, uh, you put him on NIV. Think of doing, uh, think of going on a mechanical ventilation, but you don't change the prophylactic dose of anticoagulation quite often. So that's what should change. So the the, the whole idea of uh, the, my exchanging ideas with you is know when to escalate, would know when to de-escalate the anticoagulation dosage. And of course, we know that these are all the, all the three types, the prophylactic, the intermediate, and the therapeutic dose. Prophylactic enoxaparin is very commonly used. It is 40 milligrams subcutaneous once a day. Then, then um, the <coughs> unfractionated heparin 5,000 units twice a day, some use thrice a day. Uh, then apixaban, rivorexaban, 10 milligram once a day. Rivorexaban is uh, quite is, is a favorite of many doctors now because it's only once a day dosing. Intermediate dosing, of course, you slightly increase the dose of enoxaparin. And when it comes to therapeutic dose, uh, you go all out. Enoxaparin is 60 milligram twice a day and the unfractionated heparin, you in fact think of starting an IV infusion, keeping an eye on the APTT and apixaban, the same dose as for uh, prophylactic or intermediate. Now, we just saw that there have been guidelines from, a, from a various organizations, American College of Cardiology, European Society of Cardiology, American College of Chest Physicians, NIH of UK, and Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists when it comes to the pregnant women. So let us touch upon one of uh, these few things here as we go through. What intensity of venous thromboembolic prophylaxis should patients with COVID-19 receive? The data, there is a lot of paucity on the data. With whatever data is available, what you need to consider to put a patient on the required anticoagulation is, is he hospitalized? What about the severity of the disease? Mild, moderate, severe? What about the observation? Have you put him on intensive care or is he in the ward? What are the predisposing factors for his venous thromboembolism? Mild, moderate, or a pretty high risk? What are the lab values, interleukin-6, the D-dimer, and the platelet count? What about the risk of bleeding? Um, and see whether you have followed the improved score or the has bled score that we just saw. Um, I think one should go through these scores. Uh, probably you could put um, a hard copy of that in the ICU. It helps a lot uh, for you, at least the junior doctors uh, who are dealing with uh, these patients in up the dose of oxygen and going on to further treatment. And of course, what about the anticoagulation uh, forum said, suggests increased intensity of venous thromboprophylaxis 
to be considered for critically ill patients. And they say that either you can think of low molecular heparin 40 milligram twice a day or 0.5 milligram subcutaneous twice a day or heparin 7,500 three times a day or low intensity heparin infusion. If you look at the International Society of Thrombosis, it either says use either low molecular heparin or the unfractionated heparin. Intermediate intensity, low molecular weight heparin can be considered in high risk, critically ill patients. And I think this is a very important line to go through, unlike the anticoagulation forum on the top. So this is what exactly I meant. Uh, one must really think of intensifying the anticoagulation uh, once we go through patients with a higher morbidity and mortality. Anoxaparin, of course, according to the ACC, 40 milligram daily, or you can use any of the uh, similar low molecular uh, heparin regimes. Only a minority of the panel considered intermediate intensity um, in this. So what it really means is, as I told you very earlier, American College of Cardiology really does not entertain the world intermediate intensity. Either they feel go on to a basic standard profile access, or if you have a very strong suspicion of a VTE, go to the therapeutic dose, keeping an eye on the parameters. This is about the drugs that we normally use, like apixaban, rivaraxaban, debigatron, and the warfarin. We very commonly use apixaban, rivaraxaban, and debigatron in India. Look at this all-cause mortality. The top one is, uh, is a dark uh, black line, is warfarin. All-cause mortality is very high. The lower most is the red one, debigatron. The all-cause mortality in patients who are on debigatron is pretty low. What about the major bleeding then? Of all these drugs, you could see that the green dotted lines is apixaban, is something that has been uh, quite well entertained, and so is rivaraxaban. So it all depends on what sort of drugs are we used to. So this is just going through here. The last three, the rivaraxaban, apixaban, and oxaban, they are all through inhibition of the factor 10A, whereas debigatron is a direct thrombin factor 2A inhibitor. Onset of action, fairly rapid in, in all these uh, latter four compounds. Half-life is also very low, except warfarin. And time to wear off the drug's effect, one stop. You know that warfarin takes a bit longer time. And remaining all are almost around 8 to 12 hours. Elimination of all the latter three drugs, especially the rivaraxaban, apixaban, is both through kidney and the liver, while debigatron is through the kidney. And some interactions, of course, have got to keep an eye on. What about the overdosing then? Are there the reversal strategies to restore normal coagulation? Yes, uh, we know the vitamin K uh, for VKAs. I don't need to go into that. And of course, for heparin, we know the protamine uh, sulfate. Specific DOAC reversal agent, idarucitzimab, is for dabigatron costs around 25,000 rupees per dose. Uh, I had to use only uh, for one patient. Uh, this lady had come from abroad. Uh, she was uh, on uh, the dabigatron uh, for chronic pulmonary emboli. Uh, she was from UK and uh, she uh, had an intracranial bleed and we had to reverse it. Uh, of course, we got the drug very late, the reversing agent. Uh, after paying around two lakhs, but by the time, fortunately, the bleeding had stopped the, on its own. Of course, there are non-specific measures that can be done in any peripheral centers, like especially the fresh frozen plasma or the cryoprecipitate. I think this slide is very important uh, because we can overshoot uh, any time. And of course, there have been certain specific uh, DOAC reversing agents, as I told you. Some of them are available in India, some of them are not, but nevertheless, uh, it's a pretty, uh, uh, very costly affair once you go into that. But normally you don't need to uh, if you keep an eye on uh, the blood parameters. What are the contraindications then? 
for the VTE profile access, the answer is common sense, meaning there are hardly any contraindications. The only two one can think of is the active hemorrhage in an admitted severe patient of COVID-19 or a severe thrombocytopenia. Thromboprophylaxis is recommended even with abnormal coagulation tests in the absence of active bleeding and held only if platelet count is less than 25,000 or fibrinogen less than 0.5. I have seen many doctors trying to stop it when it is less than 50,000. So I think these criteria are very important uh, when, when uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic bomb is about to explode. Uh, we really need to keep an eye on all these. Abnormal PT or a PTT is not a contraindication to thromboprophylaxis. This, this, this is a beautiful sentence we should, we should be very particular about. Therapeutic anticoagulation, however, may need to be held if platelet count is less than 30 to 50 or a fibrinogen, meaning in, even in these patients where you think it is a contraindication, it is probably safe to go ahead with a regular usual thromboprofile access, keeping an eye on a platelet count and the fibrinogen levels. And of course, if it is really contraindicated, you can't use an anticoagulation. What do you do then? All the four forms, the anticoagulation forum, the American College of Cardiology, the chest physicians agree that we recommend consistent application of intermittent pneumatic compression devices with regular reassessment of conversion to pharmacologic prophylaxis, meaning you ultimately plan to put the patient on the pharmacologic profile access. And intermittent pneumatic compressions are definitely available uh, in many five-star hospitals, but maybe they could be available in peripheral centers also. What drugs are recommended? Of course, as I already said, depends on availability and the family and, and the familiarity. Try to know the where all uh, the act, of course, the favorite drugs like uh, apixaban, rivaroxaban are always through this factor um, 10A. And we know all this, and I don't want to go into the details, it takes unnecessary time. So one of the common that we use is heparin and enoxaparin. Heparin is very cheap. Um, uh, antidote is there, onset is immediate, drug reactions are minimal, can be stopped any time. Whereas enoxaparin is a bit costlier than heparin. Uh, doesn't need any monitoring, one to two short subcutaneous bleeding can occur and partial antidote porcine uh, and one has to really be careful of reducing the dose in presence of uh, enoxaparin. And what about the therapeutic regime then? One has to think of, you can either think of low molecular heparin or you can think of the unfractionated heparin. However, the low molecular heparin is better preferred uh, because it is easy to monitor it. And uh, however, in patients with acute kidney injury or a creatinine clearance of less than 15 to 30, you should prefer heparin. Meaning, keep a close eye on creatinine clearance when you put the patient on low molecular heparin because it invariably happens that patient, this, the nurse gives it subcutaneously OD or PD and even when creatinine gradually rises, uh, you just tend to continue in a very busy ward when you are overstressed. So make certain if the creatinine clearance is less, you need to stop low molecular heparin and switch on to uh, the regular heparin. And of course, uh, even in patients with high bleeding risk, uh, you have to think of low molecular weight heparin over UFH. And of course, we know that in presence of renal uh, insufficiency, uh, you need to reduce the dosage. You can always go through uh, the brochure that is accompanying the drugs that you are using. And we know that you know, enoxaparin is normally used. And when you are using in profile access, uh, more than 30 uh, ml uh, creatine in clearance, you don't need to adjust. And less than 30, you can continue enoxaparin but reduce the dose. And what is important is accumulation may occur with repeated doses. 
and even in such cases unfractionated heparin should be uh, preferred and one thing that i um, liked in the last sentence here use of low molecular heparin in patients with renal insufficiency has been associated with hyperkalemia so this i think is very important point especially uh, when we are faced with uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome or myocardial infarction secondary to coagulopathy itself uh, where one may need of doing many more uh, primary procedures uh, we really need to keep an eye on what anticoagulant we are using and uh, the renal uh, uh, parameters you can see here heparin has been implicated in binding to covid 19 spike protein as well as down regulating interleukin 6 so this is the superiority of the heparin thus unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin remains as the best choice of anticoagulant for admitted patients so when it comes to uh versus lmwh i think for all practical purposes low molecular heparin um, uh, makes a better choice then what about these advantages of uh, all these noax low risk of bleeding rapid onset of action predictable, predictable anticoagulant effect specific coenza coagulation enzyme is targeted low food interaction lower risk of drug interaction and lower adverse effects meaning noax are extremely safe uh, in today's world so i don't need to go into all this uh, we know you know xaparin and unfractionated heparin the dosage which gradually goes on increasing to intermediate to the therapeutic dosage what about the after discharge you discharge the patient he gets better do you continue anticoagulation regime a good study here this is where in river rexaban was compared with a placebo and they did show that the events were reduced in patients who were on a river rexaban therefore the, there is one school of thought that says you could continue for about 6 weeks especially in patients uh, who have got varicose veins for example uh, who may be more prone for further episodes of vte and therefore after discharge there is no post discharge clot prevention studies that have so far been done however consider risk benefit for low dose rivaroxaban for each discharged covid 19 patient so some have been discharged early and others have had prolonged icu stay so this all depends on the uh, on the way the treating clinician thinks and his experience whether he wants some sort of oral anticoagulation continued after discharge if clotting is assumed but not proven consider completing 3 months anticoagulant course at home for warfarin patients atrial fibrillation patients consider doac instead of warfarin to avoid the need for ptinr monitoring consider less frequent monitoring where feasible and of course there have been uh, many ways of going about this i don't want to go into these details contraindications to anticoagulation i think this is something that we need to know especially even up to the junior doctor levels active bleeding within 3 months intracranial bleed within 1 year known potential bleed site like a peptic ulcer although uh, some are very hopeful that you dump them with the proton pump inhibitors or with a combination of h2 blo uh, blockers and and just put them on uh, maybe a prophylactic uh, anticoagulation i am not sure about it then thrombocytopenia platelet count of less than 50000 significant liver disease keep an eye on the inr especially in a patient who has been a chronic alcoholic then patient who have undergone lumbar puncture epidural spinal anesthesia within previous 4 hours or expected within next 12 hours or patients who have got a very severe accelerated uncontrolled hypertension more than 230 by 120 now what about the post discharge extended anticoagulation who do we do that it's given in select patients who are the select patients d dimer more than two times the upper limit at the time of discharge stay in icu for a longer time patients more than 60 years of age immobilized for 7 days prior venous thromboembolism 
diagnosed thrombophilia, current lower limb paralysis, current cancer. So what are the agents for post-discharge? The same thing again, rivaraxaban, which advantage of a single daily dose, apixaban 2.5 milligram BD, and if you are using enoxaparin, you can use it subcutaneously 40 milligram OD. Duration for post-discharge extended coagulation minimum four weeks, maximum of around 45 days that has been, what has been uh, said so far. Chronic anticoagulant and T platelet therapy, of course, one has to uh, really switch on to uh, NOAX from the parenteral and the VKAs. Pregnant and the lactating, this is a very important uh, segment. The anticoagulant prophylaxis indications are same as a non-pregnant patient, but the choice of anticoagulant should be taken into account. Heparin, enoxaparin, and warfarin are not secreted in breast milk. So these are recommended. NOAX are not recommended due to the lack of safety data. So this is very important in pregnant women. Uh, there are, especially in the organogenesis, in the first three, four months of pregnancy, we really need to take this history and in a hurry and in a huge volume in pandemics, we normally tend to take the history of uh, the menstruation uh, in many of the young uh, women. And now that the second pandemic is affecting many younger people, I think this history is very important. And unfortunately, uh, many women do not know that they are pregnant until the time of delivery. Uh, it happened to me, she was a nurse actually. She came to me uh, because the neighbors complained that you are becoming obese day by day, particularly on the abdomen. She came to me, she, she never cared for her stopped menstruation. When somebody said she could be having cancer or a tumor, when I got ultrasound done, she was pregnant and delivered the next day. So there are some Indian women who are unaware of their pregnancy, which we can't help. But nevertheless, I think history is very important in, 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 such, in such patients. So um, what are the things to be kept in mind? VTE may still develop with prophylaxis or treatment dose. This point is very important for medical legal entity. You still have got to tell the patients now that patients' relatives are very easily uh, ready to hit you and uh, break your bones and uh, screw up all the uh, hospital uh, instruments at the drop of a hat. Uh, they say, we have spent so much of money. We have brought all the drugs that you wanted. And you said prophylaxis will prevent the clot, prevent the embolism. He still has. Please remember, 30% of patients on anticoagulation, anticoagulant prophylaxis may have a thromboembolic episode. So dose must be adjusted, as I just said, uh, see whether he needs prophylaxis, he need, you need to intensify, or you need to give the treatment dose. Of course, all along, make certain that the risk benefit ratio is always uh, taken care of. Of course, we know all this, I don't want to go over this. Um, after discharge, if clotting is assumed but not proven, as I said, uh, consider completing three months anticoagulant course. And what about the ultrasound screening for detection of asymptomatic deep vein thrombosis in your admitted patient? Well, the CHEST and the American College of Cardiology hospitalize patients with COVID-19 with elevated D-dimer, more than 1,500 cannot be recommended. Therefore, in a critically ill COVID-19 patient, we suggest against a routine ultrasound screening um, uh, for the detection of asymptomatic DVT. I think this is very important. Uh, you need to uh, put this uh, in a case paper that you have not been done according to the recent guidelines and go through all these exceptions where one may have to do. You know what, this special population pregnancy, I have already told you, um, all pregnant women admitted with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 should be offered a prophylactic low molecular heparin unless birth is expected within uh, 12 hours. Anticoagulation during labor should be avoided. Switch to unfractionated heparin. Of course, it's a common sense with limited exceptions. Most obstetricians replace 
therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin with unfractionated heparin at 36 to 37 weeks of gestation. So always take the help of a gynecologist when you admit uh, patients with a late pregnancy with COVID. And of course, uh, novel oral anticoagulants, I don't need to tell more about it. Why shouldn't we consider oral anticoagulants in the hospitalized patient? Uh, according to the Anticoagulant Forum, according to the American Society of Hematology, according to the American College of Cardiology, according to the NIH of UK, according to the European Society of Cardiology, this suggests that, this suggests in these people, just one second, oops, 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 sorry, I think I'm losing it. I just got rid of that. Okay, let's just go on to this duration of therapeutic anticoagulants. As I already said, initial treatment for 21 days, long term is for three to six months, and extended period is after this about three to six months. So, all in all, try to reduce this extended dose. Again, you can use apixaban, dabigatron, and rivorexaban, uh, depending on what you'd like to use. For example, Hello? Hello, Gautam? Sir. Gautam, what happened? Oh. Sir, I think some issue, sir. Uh, Try contacting um, him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Satur? Dr. Satur? Gautam, can you Satur, sir? Yes, sir. I, I will call him, sir. We are facing some uh, oh. technical issue. Yeah, from okay, the okay. Expert, sir. Are you going to call Gautam? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. okay. Can you see me? No, we can't. No, now? We can't. Now? Can you hear no, no, me? No, no, uh, Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear, sir. But we can't see you. We can hear you, but we are not able to see you. See okay, you. I think maybe hopefully uh, so I should be able to... Come back. Okay, <clears throat> now uh, only another three, four slides are remaining. 
switching to oral anticoagulants of course one has to uh, it has already been touched i don't want to go uh, into details what about the antiplatelets uh, this also i don't need to read heparin induced thrombocytopenia i think one has to be uh, very careful uh, if this becomes pretty unpredictable at times so uh, one has to really go through those certain criteria that are already there i don't want to go into those details whenever you suspect heparin induced thrombocytopenia best thing is to stop all the heparin <clears throat> and probably keep the patient for watching for some time stop warfarin and what about the overt bleeding was <clears throat> stop bleeding related anti thrombotic agents administer anti antidote so i don't want to go into all these details so to sum up <clears throat> i like to say that uh, we have got some level of knowledge regarding anticoagulation in patients with covid-19 patients who are at home isolation with a mild covid do not need anticoagulation of any sort some people are put on aspirin even that is not necessary once the patient becomes into moderate moderate to severe or severe covid-19 one has to think of which group of anticoagulation would he fit into does he fit into the prophylactic the intermediate or the therapeutic knowing at all times that patient any time who was on prophylactic with a shot of pulmonary emboli that he throws you shift him on to the treatment anticoagulation so with this i wish to stop my lecture here if there are any questions i'd like to go through any discussions or any other points put forth i'd love to share the ideas of other people thank you very much thank you so much sir yeah dr rupashree okay good afternoon to one and all Uh, first of all, I would like to express my thanks to our speaker, Dr. G. B. Sathur sir, for giving us such a clear and detailed information on various aspects of coagulopathy, anticoagulation in uh, COVID uh, management. Uh, I'll take up this question, uh, Dr. Shobha Rani Hiraman. She wants to know one of her family member uh, was advised anticoagulation therapy for four weeks post COVID, but <coughs> after 15 days of uh, discharge they are uh, advised for a surgery and uh, they have stopped the uh, uh, coagulant anticoagulants now her concern is uh, what will be the probable risk <clears throat> now uh, there are two issues here uh, what was the status of covid 19 when oral anticoagulation post discharge was started number 1 is it a elective surgery that she is undergoing number 2 so i think these two are very important to answer okay we have uh, madam can you ask your question directly shobha rani madam she can talk directly no problem yes 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 yeah i thought maybe yes sir uh, so i mean the, the this hospital is like uh, uh, i mean for covid i was hospitalized That's okay. the first thing. When you had you were mentioning the home or uh, home isolation or uh, COVID, you had mentioned, na, just uh, ending in the ending. So it yeah. was a hospitalized case okay. of COVID, and okay. uh, after like I was advised to take uh, uh, four weeks of anticoagulant. Which one? Some uh, lump was uh, developed, and I urgently I no, had no, to undergo what, surgery. What, so what, I had to. What, what anticoagulant was were you put on actually i don't remember now sir no, but tablet uh, yeah yeah i can check don't. it out yeah okay right because it's some um, uh, october it was so i am not able to remember it was it happened in october how was so, your how, how was your course during admission did you have a lot of problems did you need very high oxygen 
was there a talk of ventilation what no, was no, that it was it was not a very uh, it was moderate it was moderate okay how many days anticoagulation have you taken now about 10 days 10 days oral i mean i was hospitalized i was hospitalized for about 8 days and post discharge about 10 days if, if the surgery can be postponed i would suggest 3 weeks of anticoagulation post discharge but now it has happened it has happened like uh, yeah already it's over it so anything i can do not to yeah, worry yeah. If the D timer. No, anything can be done. Yeah. If the D timer were all you know fairly okay and uh, oxygen requirement was very you know not very high when you got admitted, it was probably borderline because you are a doctor. They must have thought, uh, let her let us put her in, although it's a mild COVID. This happens at times. So you know this could could have been a bit of a overstepping the treatment with you. So I don't think there was any harm in stopping it. Okay. Yeah, I was a bit concerned. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Gautam, do we have any hand raise? No, madam. There was one chat there. Yes, sir. I'll read out for you. Is there any role of anti-platelets prophylaxis? <clears throat> Not really. Not really. That's a very that is like a poor man's uh, thrombolytic you know like, like an aspirin uh, in the absence of thrombolytic for an mi um, you know i i wouldn't uh, really think of anything else apixaban or rivaroxaban are pretty ideal to uh, to follow for because you need an effective drug <clears throat> because as i told you in 40 30 for tens of patients an effective anticoagulation does not prevent vt even post discharge so you know especially if they were admitted with uh, severe covid i think they are the ones good amount of post discharge is required okay ibrahim please ask question thing to all hey go ahead Uh, i should ask that uh, what is the post management for the pregnant mother and also if that will uh, how the drugs will affect the fetus <clears throat> um if as normally according to you know the obstetrics uh, uk guidelines around 36 weeks onwards uh, they normally try uh, unfractionated heparin and stop heparin for about uh, 12 to 24 hours prior to surgery and not give anything i think this is low molecular heparin of course is, is something that normally uh, we don't prefer in them no no harm though although so what what we will with the post management for the pregnant mother what we will as a possible after the delivery after the delivery you mean yes sir okay uh, this is this is a very good question <clears throat> it all depends on has she come out of the covid acute stage post delivery if the patient parameters like d dimer fibrinogen il6 they tend to remain almost normal i mm. think i would tend to keep them watched although low molecular heparin does not uh, secrete into breast milk uh, heparin doesn't secrete into breast milk as i said that yes. can be continued you know if you think uh, it needs to be continued it's not an absolute contraindication yes sir thank you sir there is a question from uh, dr praveen yeah are there any drugs which prevent endothelial dysfunction or any drugs preventing further uh, damage mm, not that i know of not that i know of maybe some interferon related compounds might help there is one by zydus but i am not sure uh, it is an uh, pegylated interferon 2b which is going to be marketed within couple of months 
uh, whether this drug specifically acts uh, on endothelium, I have no idea. But my, my guess would be interferon-related compounds might work. Okay. So we have a request from Dr. Shruti, like uh, if we can share the slide that we are doing it, sir, like for the information of the participants, we would like uh, sir, to share your presentation so that it will be hosted in our uh, official website and uh, it will be open for reference to many of the doctors. Yeah, yeah, you can take it, no problem. Yes. Not but if you want, what I can do is because there are uh, about 140 slides from which I had selected around 90. So if you want, I can cut it down to 90 and send back to you. Otherwise, you'll get confused. Sure, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. The you current understand? presentation can be given, sir. Ah, yeah. This presentation you can take, but the slides continue. I don't know how, uh, whether they come to you. I have no idea. Okay. You can, you can probably send it to us again. What yeah. is here with us, we will uh, yeah. currently post. I can do that. I can if you just give Thank me you, a, email ID. I can do that. Yeah. yeah. Gautam, please send your email ID. Sir will send it for uh, hosting purpose. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, what do you then answer? Hello? Yes, yes. Diana. Huh. Okay, thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Rupashi and Dr. Uh, Mahindra. Hello? Ah. Hello? Yes, ah. Dear yes. friends and participants. Yes. Yeah. Dear friends and participants, we are all come to the stage of the end of the today's uh, program. And it's my proud privilege to deliver the vote of thanks. And we are all joined for the RGHS. ECHO India online training for COVID-19 awareness. And today's topic was a critical appraisal of anticoagulation in COVID management. On behalf of Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, I thank our Vice Chancellor and Registrar for giving us the opportunity to take up this training session. And then today the speaker was Dr. G.B. Satur, sir, and his talk was very informative. And we thank you, sir, for your uh, uh, very informative talk. On behalf of Raju Gandhi University Vice Chancellor and uh, Registrar, we thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And then uh, sir, we thank the ECHO India, the coordinator, uh, Gautam, for his uh, uh, constant uh, uh, coordination for this program. And then we thank the officers of RGHS who are involved in this program. And then we thank all the participants who are participated in today's program. Thank you, one and all. Hello. Yeah. Ah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Satur, sir. Gautam, ah. you cannot talk to me. Sir, next you. question, uh, can I share the screen, sir? Gautam, please Some... post the uh, flyer for the next uh, session. We'll announce it. It is for the information of all the participants. Uh, another program is scheduled on 11th May, that is on Tuesday at 3 o'clock. The topic is all about phase 3 of COVID-19 vaccination in Karnataka. It will be delivered by Dr. Lokesh Alahari, MBBS, MPH, DNV, Field Epidemiology. I request everybody to uh, use this uh, forum for all the information. And uh, see you on 11th May at 3 o'clock. Thank you so much. Thank you. The participants you. may also Thank share you. this information with others. Thank you, Satur, sir. Have a okay, night. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Gautam, you can close the meeting.